All right. Well, uh, welcome everybody to the 31st virtual shadowing session. Uh, tonight, we are joined by Dr. Elaine Reno, um, and she is going to be presenting about emergency travel and wilderness medicine. Um, as always, uh, you can follow us on Instagram at virtual shadowing. Uh, follow us on YouTube, uh, where we keep all the recorded sessions at pre-health virtual shadowing, and then visit us on our website at virtualshadowing.com. Uh, and we can go to the next slide, please. And uh, just as a heads up, um, the session tonight will be between one and a half to two hours long, um, and we will answer all questions about the assessment at the very end of the session, so don't worry about that for now. Um, so uh, next week, we have a specialty spotlight for OBGYN. Um, the following week, we have a PA spotlight in infectious disease with Josh and uh, non-PAC, uh, their physician assistants. And then just join us at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time on Zoom here or on YouTube Live if you're unable to make it on Zoom. Right, next slide, please. Oh, is it stuck on this one? Okay, there we go. <laughs> All right, always... and then we have, <laughs> there we go, I see it. So this is the Virtual Shadowing Working Group. We are joined tonight by Reagan, myself, Cheyenne, um, and uh, Taylor, Alana, Rachel, Anirudh, Maryam, Rohit, and we have um, Dr. Fowler, Dr. Morchetti, and Dr. Salazar. Um, and so we can go to the next slide, please. All right, and we have um, a brief announcement from Dr. Salazar, so I'll let him take it away. Oh, is he, let's see, has to unmute. There we go. Hey guys, how y'all doing? It's good to see you. I hope everybody had a Merry Christmas. Um, I am so glad to be here tonight and thanks uh, to everybody once again for all the, the love and support my dad is doing phenomenally. So I'm really glad to see you. Got a uh, quick announcement for you. We have our websites. I may want to write it down or check out my Instagram shortly. It's going to be www.v as in vase, c o p as in paul, dot w s. We are building it and pretty shortly we're going to be posting information on how to sign up for the program, payment, and all that wonderful stuff. So we have a website. In the meantime, keep uh, checking my account. There's my IG right there for you been posting uh, material pretty much every day, cool pictures. Thanks to all of you who check them out. And um, one more announcement, our contest uh, last time for the pilot was so successful. We're gonna be running a second uh, pilot episode, this time with more cases. We're gonna be trialing out some new stuff. So you may wanna check it out. Last time we invited 500 uh, lucky winners. This time we may bump it up a little bit. So. Um, best of luck. Keep posted for the information, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you soon. All right. Thank you. All right. And so we're going to have two question and answer sessions um, during this session. Uh, it'll be one in the middle and one at the very end of tonight's presentation. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, type them in the Zoom chat uh, or the YouTube live chat, and we will do our best to get to them during those Q&A sessions. All right. All right, and then I will let Dr. Reno take it away. Hi guys, so my name is Dr. Elaine Reno. Um, I was asked to um, give this presentation and so I'm gonna kind of start um, at the background and then if there's questions, um, send them in the chat and you know, um, Reagan or whoever, feel free to um, break in and uh, ask me questions as we go. Um, so, um, my name is Elaine Reno. I am a physician at the University of Colorado, um, but my background, I'm from rural Ohio. I'm from Waynesville, Ohio. Um, I did my undergraduate in molecular genetics at Ohio State University, um, and then I did uh, two gap years, actually, so not just one, um, and I actually initially graduated. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I didn't know anyone in medicine. I was from a, like a small town in Ohio and I didn't know any doctors. And so um, uh, the first job I got out of uh, undergrad was I was actually a cocktail waitress in Laughlin, Nevada at the Riverside Casino. Um, and I did it mainly because it was the first job I could find with healthcare. Um, and then I started kind of looking around what I, what I wanted to do. And I 
landed at the University of Colorado in an oncology research lab. Um, and I realized that I really, really enjoyed basic science. Um, and I thought the research we were doing was really neat. But part of my job was that I would go to the operating room with patients and I would consent them, um, not for surgery, but we would, when pathology was done with their tumor, we would take portions of their tumor and study it in the lab um, and try and figure out you know, what mutations led to them developing cancer. And I realized my absolute favorite part of my job every single time was to like go and meet these women and meet their families and talk to them and ask about, you know, ask if they would be willing to donate their cancer samples. Um, and honestly, pretty much everyone was like, yep, you can have my cancer because I don't want it anymore. Um, and just like sitting with them in the pre-op area. Um, and so that made me realize that while I loved the basic science I was doing, if my favorite part of my job every single time is getting to sit with patients and talk to them, then maybe I should be an MD and not a PhD. So I applied to medical school. Um, I did medical school at the University of Cincinnati. Um, I did residency. Um, I came back out to Colorado uh, and I did residency at a program called um, Denver Health. Uh, and it's, it's joint between Denver Health, which is what we call a county hospital. And there's actually very few of them left in the United States. And so Denver Health is funded um, by taxes in the city of Denver. And then we had several other training sites, but the University of Colorado being our second major training site, and then Dev Denver Children's being our third major training site. And so I did residency out there. And this is me. I'm the one in green scrubs next to the ambulance. Um, and that's at Children's Hospital. And in the background, that little hospital you can see on the far left of the photo is the University of Colorado. And the Children's Hospital and the Adult Hospital are literally right next door to each other, uh, which is very convenient. Um, so then after residency, um, I wasn't quite sure, um, you know, exactly what I wanted to do and where I wanted to take my career. And so I did almost like a choose your own adventure fellowship. And so I did a fellowship in wilderness medicine and I did a lot of things during that fellowship. So the first is um, we study altitude induced illness here in Colorado because we're the mile high city. And so we, um, we see very little of it in Denver. We see lots of it up in our mountain towns from um, skiers and ski traffic. And so we have an altitude research center out here in Colorado. Um, and so I did some clinical work through the Altitude Research Center. Um, I did some training in wilderness medicine, which the best I can tell you is it's a lot like um, EMS, only uh, with longer transport times and less supplies. Um, and so I did some training in um, wilderness medicine and in, you know, uh, injuries related to that. And then the big thing I did as well, um, was I really wanted to get um, more training in infectious disease and you know global health. And so I um, went to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And almost no one had heard of that until I think uh, COVID-19 hit. And now I feel like every time you read an article, um, there's someone from the London School that's being quoted. So um, it's the second oldest um, uh, tropical medicine training program in the world. And there's a huge focus on infectious disease and global health. And I really spent several months studying, you know, medical diseases we don't see as commonly in the United States, but that we see on a worldwide basis. Um, and so we spent a lot of time on HIV, on malaria, on tuberculosis. Um, those are probably the three biggest ones, but other things, maternal health, malnutrition, um, things like that. We, you know, um, in the UK, they actually have an infectious disease hospital. And so we did some clinical work there and they still um, have patients with diseases that we see very uncommonly in the United States, like leprosy. Um, and so it was a really, really great education. I um, mean, it was just a really great experience. So there was a hundred physicians, you had to be an MD or DO um, to join the program. Um, and I think we represented 60 countries and 100 different physicians. And 
Um, I'm still in contact with almost everyone from that program. We have like a WhatsApp chat. Um, and, you know, now we've dispersed all over the world. And it's been great, actually, with COVID-19, because um, obviously in the United States, we were not the first to see it. But I have friends from the program who, you know, live all over the world, including in parts of Asia that started to see cases well before us. And so we've been able to talk about the disease pathology we're seeing, how it's been influenced, um, how it's traveled around the world, how other hospitals are handling it. Um, and it, uh, honestly, it's been a great experience. So we've been talking about the UK strain now for days and days and days. And I just saw in the news that Colorado has the first case of it. Um, so I guess we'll see from here where it goes. But so it was a really, really wonderful training program for me. And I hope one day to employ it by doing something like Doctors Without Borders. Um, but as a, we'll get to in a minute, that's probably not the plan right now. So um, this is my family. This is why I probably will not go on a long deployment with Doctors Without Borders in the next couple months. Um, and that's because uh, obviously in the top left is my husband and then I have two kids. Um, I have a three-year-old and then we have a baby that was just born uh, this summer. Um, during kind of the COVID lull, um, and she is now four months old. So what do I do now? Um, so I'm an assistant professor of emergency medicine at the University of Colorado. Um, I work clinically in the emergency room for most of my clinical time. Uh, we have a virtual health center. Um, so one of the things we found with COVID-19 we found a couple of things. So the first is that um, because we're the mile high city, our patients tend to be hypoxic. Um, so have low oxygen saturations and they tend to continue to have low oxygen saturations for prolonged periods of time after COVID-19. Because, you know, if they would be 95% at sea level in Denver, they're going to be 89%. And honestly, at baseline, most people who live in Colorado have lower oxygen saturations. And we don't think anything of it. But with COVID, we struggled a little bit more. So we started sending patients home on supplemental oxygen while wearing a um, cardiac device that monitored their heart rate and their oxygen saturations. Um, and then we started titrating them at home off of their oxygen over the next two weeks so they could get out of the hospital faster. So I was doing some of that work. And then the other thing we started doing is um, monitoring several of the outlying ICUs all over the state. So Colorado is a little bit odd in that, um, you know, we have all this like major metropolitan city in Denver, but then up in the mountains, we have um, some areas and some hospitals that are quite remote. And, you know, if weather is perfect, maybe you have a four to six hour drive to get a patient out of there um, and maybe a two to three hour flight if the weather is bad, there are times when patients just cannot be evacuated. Like the, they, we can't fly a chopper because the, it's unsafe to fly. Um, and that happens a lot. Sometimes actually the major highway for us, it's I-70 is closed if the avalanche danger is too high. And so there's literally no way to evacuate anyone out of some of our small mountain towns. And so um, they can land in very small ICUs and a lot of what we do through the virtual health center is monitor remote patients in um, some of those smaller outlying ICUs in conjunction with those primary ICU teams and provide input. And so I do that. And then the third thing I do, which I don't do right now because uh, no one is traveling, but hopefully eventually it will, is I work part-time in an infectious disease clinic where I do um, pre-travel counseling. And so um, we talk about where are you going in the world and how you can how can you stay safe um, depending on where you're going. And so those are the kind of the major clinical things we do. And I like it because each piece of it is something different for me. So when I um, am in the virtual health center, I'm you know looking at ICU level of care and I'm um, doing prolonged um, care for these patients and um, helping and assisting. When I'm in the travel clinic, I actually partner with a pediatrician and every family visit is an hour and we bring the whole family in and we talk about how do you go safely and I tag team with the pediatrician and it's just, you know, I don't think 
in emergency medicine, we sit down with a family for an hour very often, but we do every time in the travel clinic. And then, you know, the patients send us photos of their adventures and we hear about where they're going. And it's just, it's all a little bit different. And to me, I really, really like each of those like different clinical settings I get to practice in. So that's what I do clinically. Um, what do I do non-clinically? So the biggest thing I like to do is work with undergraduate students who want to go into healthcare related careers. And so when I was a resident, um, we started a program um, at the University of Colorado and we, we're not doing it right now because of COVID-19, but we hope to start it up again soon. So we've had students, hundreds of them from all over the country and some from all over the world come and spend two weeks with us. And they spend the first week um, at the University of Colorado and they learn um, basic first aid and they shadow in the emergency department and they ride along with EMS um, and they go to lectures and we do ultrasounding. Um, they learn how to ultrasound. We do some dissection work. Um, we do lots of case-based scenarios. Um, we do, we expose them to some things that we don't expect them to do, but just for fun, things like suturing, um, and then the second week we go up into the mountains and they spend a week um, uh, learning some survival things in the mountains like water purification, some search and rescue techniques, but also doing um, simulation work on, you know, how to um, take care of a patient up in the mountains. So what would I do if I was hiking and this happened? How do I recognize these types of injuries? How do I splint this? How do I evacuate it? And we intersperse that with lots of fun. So the students go hiking, they go kayaking, they go canoeing, sometimes they go zip lining. And we do a version of the course in uh, Central America in a, on a beach in Costa Rica for about two weeks as well. And so um, that is my most favorite thing ever is to be with our undergrads either up in the mountains in Colorado or in Central America. We've done it for five years and the first round of our students, a lot of them have now matriculated into graduate school. So nursing grad programs, um, medical school, some of them pharmacy school, some of them PA school. We've even had a veterinarian or two. So, um, and then I do other teaching. So um, I taught at the University of Wyoming to their nursing program. Um, I've taught our ski patrollers um, up in Colorado which is actually a ton of fun because they can absolutely out ski me. And so I have to pretend like I can keep up um, and they pretend like they're not going extra slow so that I can keep up. Um, and I get to meet all the avalanche dogs, which is fabulous. Um, I've taught our paramedics. We're building a first aid course um, online and uh, e-wilderness first aid class that we're hoping to stand up soon. And so lots of teaching, although that's definitely changed a lot. Um, and we're trying to find safe ways to do it in terms of COVID-19 right now. So here are pictures from um, the class we do here in Colorado. And so you can see the students, we do it summer and winter. Um, the students are up in the mountains um, hiking. They're learning how to do vital signs on the bottom left um, and they're listening to each other's hearts and lungs. In the middle here, um, they're working with one of our um, faculty, Dr. Brown. He's the gentleman on the uh, far right um, in the tan color t-shirt. I guess it's a dress shirt, but, um, and he's our ultrasound guru. And um, we bring a whole bunch of ultrasounds in and we do some ultrasound training and then we let them kind of play with the ultrasound and scan each other's, you know, bellies and hearts and um, whatnot. All the students get CPR certified. That's what they're doing on the top right. And then um, we, in the summer, they camp. In the winter, actually, they build snow caves. And then the more adventurous ones will usually sleep in it. And the less adventurous ones uh, will usually prefer to sleep in the lodge. But um, I would advise you to sleep in the snow cave because it's lots of fun and not that cold. So I also do um, some non-clinical work. So I do research. So this is kind of the re some of the research we've been looking at both through the um, mainly through the uh, team clinic. So we've been looking at yellow fever and travelers. We've been looking at high altitude related illnesses because um, Colorado is one of the few spots in the United States 
to really get high altitude related illness um, because some of our ski resorts break about 12,000 feet and peak out at about 14,000 feet. And so if you come from Florida, you fly into Denver, you drive up to the mountains and you, and you get on the ski slopes, you're ascending from essentially sea level to 14,000 feet in under 12 hours. And people can definitely develop um, medical uh, illness related to it. Um, most commonly pulmonary edema, but, um, and then, you know, we've, been looking at vaccine safety related to yellow fever. And so that's some of the research I do through the team clinic. Um, I also do some international education work. So we've been working with the World Health Organization to stand up a um, uh, emergency um, first aid course. And we wanted some supplemental education. So we built a series in our of um, basic emergency care videos of which my uh, three-year-old had a starring role as the pediatric patient. Um, teaching um, practitioners all over the world how to provide basic emergency care in an emergency setting. So things like opening airways, um, tourniquets, um, wound care, things like that. I've taught some internationally. So um, I taught a wilderness first aid course in Peru. Um, to their Mountain Guiding Association. Um, so things like that. I'm sure there's more in there, but those I feel like are kind of the highlights. Um, do you want to pause and see if there's questions or should I go on to videos? Um, Cheyenne, you want to stop now? Um, or we can go, we, we have loads, we have loads of questions. Yeah, no, we're ready for questions whenever you are. So if you want to. Well, share. let's do some questions. We, we have a bunch of questions. Let me start with one, Elaine. How did you find okay. your fellowship in wilderness medicine? Uh, I actually think I just got lucky. So I sort of stumbled into it. Like, um, I, you know, I chose Denver Health as a residency training program because it, it it's in a very, very excellent residency training program, but also it and a mix of academic work and um, uh, community work in terms of a county hospital. I don't think I realized at the time it'd be like a stronghold of wilderness medicine or um, global health, but you know, I got there and I got lucky and I was interested. And so I started doing it. Um, and I think, you know, wilderness medicine is really about, it's kind of a merger of global health and um, uh, and EMS, it's really about medicine in low resource settings. And so um, that's what appealed to me about it. It's because um, I think it lets me work with our ski patrollers. It work, lets me work with our paramedics, but it lets me um, have a global health focus as well. And so, I don't know, I guess I sort of stumbled into it. So did you uh, ever know my old buddy, Paul Auerbach, who started the Wilderness Medicine Society? I do. I don't, I have met uh, Dr. Auerbach uh, I think at WMS Society meetings, but I don't know if he knows who I am. Oh, well, so. and he's got gray hair like mine now. We've been around for a while together. Um, so what's the effect of high altitude on COVID from the standpoint of your patients when you're living up a mile up in Denver? That's a great question. Um, I don't, we need to look at outcomes, honestly, um, and see if there's different mortality re related to it. Uh, as far as I can tell, you know, initially when everyone was developing pulmonary edema, some people were arguing that like COVID-19 mimicked high altitude pulmonary edema, which I would argue it, it's not even close. It's not in any way similar. I think it's our not patients pathophysiologically, probably, it's not pathophysiologically similar at all. It's, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, not at all. Um, I think our patients probably have prolonged hypoxia in a, in a similar way to, that pneumonia patients do um, or like severe COPD years or sickle cell disease is um, quite pronounced in Colorado and patients tend to have worse clinical disease courses because of the hypoxia, it makes the sickling worse. Um, and so my assumption is that COVID-19 is probably a little bit worse out here. Yeah, so, um, so let's change have... tracks a little and I'll turn the questions over to you, Shayon, in just a moment. How adaptable is a wilderness medicine background? I mean, how applicable, for example, would those skills be in other settings, such as in street medicine, 
and what and what Gil and I do, you know, as as you well know, EMS in the field and so forth. Does wilderness medicine training help there? I think you know. I mean, a lot of wilderness medicine training is essentially the exact same as EMS training, like learning how to practice without all the things you normally have at your disposal. Um, I think there's less training in terms of, you know, we at the EMS um, fellowship here. I feel like does a lot of incident command. Um, for the city and things like that. And I think there's less of that. Um, But overall, you know, disaster medicine, EMS, wilderness medicine, global health, in some ways, they're all sort of like spins on a similar approach, which is, you know, practicing medicine outside the ED. And so uh, I, I think it probably there's a lot of overlap. There, there is a question that just got, just popped up in chat that I have no idea how many wilderness medicine fellowship spots there are. I have a pretty good idea for EMS, but I don't know for wilderness. I actually don't know that either. I should look that up. Okay. What they were wanting to know is, hey, man, this is so cool. How many spots are going to be available when I get there? Uh, go ahead, Shayana. Uh, um, you want to take some more questions or you want what do you want to do? Um, yeah, if Dr. Reno wants to get some more questions, we have plenty. Well, let's roll. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. So uh, the first question that I see here, uh, the student asks, Dr. Reno, what made you choose emergency medicine instead of going back to oncology? That's a good question. Um, so a lot of things. So um, I really looked at doing gynecological oncology because that was where my research was in. Um, uh I, for me personally, I like this. So first in terms of gynecological oncology, I realize that I'm not a surgeon. Like I like the OR, but I don't love it. It's not where I belong every day, all day long. Um, I like meeting patients. I like talking to them. I like treating patients across the entire spectrum of life. So from infants to the elderly, um, I like treating patients across like kind of the entire spectrum of, um, you know, like who we are in society. So in the emergency room, there's actually a federal law that says we take care of everyone, regardless of their ability to pay. So it does not matter if you are the CEO of the hospital, or the gentleman who lives, you know, across the street, and is homeless, like we will take care of you, um, no matter whether you have the ability to pay that bill or not. And so I never wanted to be a, a physician that you know, like only took insurance or only took specific types of insurance. Like I wanted to be able to take care of anyone under any circumstance, um, no matter who they were and what they came to me with. And I think emergency medicine is really um, the place that that, um, that that aligns with. And that ability, taking care of everyone was important enough to me that when I looked for residency programs, Um, I looked for places that really had a focus on community and on, um, and on kind of that ethos, which is why I ended up at a county program in Denver. So. Thank you for sharing that. Um, So the next question, uh, this one's interesting. Um, How do med schools react if you mention wanting to work in third world countries or with something like Doctors Without Borders? Um, Because I know that some medical schools might have a preference perhaps for you to stay in that state or that area? Um, Do they view that positively? I mean, I think every, uh, it might depend on the school, you know, um, uh, I guess our, where the University of Colorado has tracks, like they have global health tracks, they have rural tracks, like if that's your interest, um, that's where most people like land is kind of in their tracks. There are some medical schools that I think have more of a primary care focus, um, but primary care based education is certainly great for global health too. Um, And so I guess I would say it's school dependent. Mm -hmm. Right, that makes sense. Um, So uh, another question that we got was, uh, can you describe a normal day in your life? Also, how many hours do you work? Oh gosh, both of those are incredibly variable. So if I'm in travel clinic, it's like totally regimented. It's, you know, like 
honestly, I set my own schedule. And so it'll be however many hours that day I want to see patients. Like that's when I'll tell them to open the schedule. Um, uh, if I'm in um, the virtual health center, a lot of those are overnight shifts. Like, so I'll work um, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. If I'm in the ED, you know, we have a rotating schedule as well, whether it's day shift, swing shift, overnight shift. So um, I guess I, I sort of like first my shifts hit my calendar and I look at when I'm working. Um, and then um, once my shifts hit my calendar, then I sort of keeping keep a running checklist of like all the other stuff I need to get done on um, whether it's a daily, weekly, or monthly basis. And I keep that kind of like checklist as a Google document. And I, when I have downtime, I, I reference it and I throw stuff into my calendar. Like you need to have this done by this date, things like that. So I guess it can be extremely variable. So um, I was working, I just came off of a big string of shifts because um, we all work sort of one holiday, whether Thanksgiving, Christmas, or New Year's. And so um, I kind of just got off of a bunch of shifts. And so now I have like a whole bunch of stuff that's piled up in terms of the list of other tasks, like research, emails, whatnot. Um, and so I'll spend the next couple of days kind of clearing that out and not in the emergency department, and then it'll swing back, so. Wow, thank you. Um... I think a lot of our students are also wondering, um, are there opportunities for surgery in a wilderness medicine setting? That's a good question. There are opportunities for surgery in a low resource global health setting. Um, there is not a lot of surgery that I would say is performed in a field setting because it's arguably not remotely safe because it's not sterile. So there is a famous... Um, a uh, case of someone who, I think it was in Antarctica, who removed his own appendix with mirrors. Um, but if you want to be a surgeon, I would presume you're going to operate in the operating room. Elaine uh, Fowler, Fowler again, uh, you would do field amputations if you had to? Uh, I mean, I guess it really depended on the circumstance. I would, I would avoid field amputations at all costs. Is that fair? So... Well, um, all right. So uh, something else that a student was wondering, um, how hard is it to get into Doctors Without Borders? Um, they say that I know this may be on their website, but what exactly are the requirements for a physician? So I would probably defer that question to Doctors Without Borders. I know if you come from a European country, um, you actually have to do a diploma in tropical medicine and hygiene. That's the course, the course I did in the UK. Um, in order to be eligible, like that's one of their requirements is that. Uh, I don't know if that's true for American physicians. I know that's true for European um, because maybe 50% of the my class was um, either going into Doctors Without Borders or has subsequently done something similar since we graduated. And a lot of them did it solely so they could do that. Um, so they could meet the eligibility requirements. But okay. if you, there are many um, ethical international organizations um, doing clinical care around the world. Um, Doctors Without Borders is probably just one of the most famous. You know, Elaine, um, I had to smile because, you know, in the ER, you know, everybody's so busy. We're all, mm -hmm. we all, obviously we have boarding in the ER where for the students, that means we can't get patients upstairs and they're stuck in the emergency room. That's a little bit like you having a patient that you can't get out of the wilderness in a way, you know, they're boarded with you. Yeah, that's, uh, I went down to Costa Rica and there's an EM residency program down there. Um, in the, I don't know if he's, gosh, I forget his name. I don't know if he's uh, still the program director, but like incredibly smart, really talented guy. Um, and he was talking about their boarding and, uh, and they were like, you know, having the same problem. And I was like, boarding is universal. So. All right. So uh, there's, so we have a sizable number of students who are also PAs um, and those who are also considering DO, the DO route. Um, so do you know, so can PAs do wilderness medicine and is wilderness medicine primarily on the focus of MD or DO or does it not matter? 
it doesn't matter at all. Like the Wilderness Medical Society, there's nurses, there's MDs, there's DOs, there's PAs. Like it, it's it really involves interest more than anything. We have um, two PAs that are in my group that are really interested in a wilderness medicine, and they both are on call for search and rescue teams um, up in uh, Boulder, Colorado, which is like I don't know half an hour north of Denver. Um, and they do uh, lots of um, EMS, like search and rescue care. Um, because if you think about, like, if you're a paramedic in um, in Boulder, Colorado, or anywhere in the mountains, like, not only do you have to know ha the medical care, um, you either have to know a lot of, like, search and rescue um, work, or you have to have a team that you can call who can... Um, mesh with you quite nicely because you know people get hurt rock climbing and they need rescued like people get hurt skiing um we have lots of backcountry skiers and so people get um, buried in avalanches and they need found so our ski patrol up in the mountains is actually incredibly sophisticated because they can have really long extrication times um like they have they can do cpr um on the lift now they have a device for that um, they can use some of the more advanced drugs, um, for prolonged extrications for really painful procedures. Um, there's a paramedic at one of the ski patrol stations, like 24 seven up in the mountains. Um, and there's a helicopter. And if anyone knows of an avalanche with a bear, with someone buried, they actually will, um, uh, pick the paramedic and the Abbey dog up. Um, from one of our local ski patrols and land as close to the field as possible. And then the dog is trained to find someone in a matter of minutes um, in a, if they're buried in an avalanche and the dogs are have sensitive enough noses, they can identify a living person versus a deceased person versus like an item of clothing from that person um, and can get out I mean, they're the best, frankly, in an avalanche um, and are then trained to start digging wherever they find a living person. So wow. does Thank that answer that. the question at all? Yes, no, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, and so uh, I guess another common question that we have is, um, uh, what's your take on balancing each of the professions you do, such as being an assistant professor and a physician simultaneously? And I guess that applies to many other specialties where students are considering academics and practicing clinical medicine. Yeah, I mean, most of what I do is practice clinical medicine. Um, I just, I do it in an academic setting primarily. Um, and so I work with residents, I work with medical students. Um, we have nursing students, we have um, PA students, like all rotating through the ED. Um, where I did residency training, we had a very, very robust paramedic training program, um, and they would rotate through the ED. And so I think it really depends on what your passions are. Like, I like working with students. I like teaching. I like meeting them. Um, and so I practice in an academic setting. Um, you know, it's not, in other fields, it might be more like academics versus um, private practice are really different, but I think in general in emergency medicine, like there's just always people around with different levels of training and want to learn, like, you know, the EMS people can talk about this much more than me, but I assume if you're in private practice, like there's still ongoing education with EMS, um, ongoing education with like nursing, things like that. So if, uh, if what I wanted was large, research awards um, and like very, you know, like studying sepsis in the emergency department and um, very aggressive research careers, then those probably dovetail with academics much more than private practice. But what I really like to do is teach and um, work with students. And so I think I could probably find that in a private practice setting as well. I just, you know, I like being in academics because there's always new things to learn and students to work with. And so that's where I kind of landed. Yes, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I'll ask one more question and then we'll let you uh, move on to the next part so we're not inundating you with questions. But um, so uh, the last question here um, is, what has been the toughest situation you or a partner have been um, in specific to wilderness medicine? 
I feel like I'd have to think about that a lot. I mean, we definitely see high altitude pulmonary edema um, a significant fit, uh, which can be really tough. But, you know, in Colorado, like if you can evacuate them, um, it tends to go pretty well. So maybe that. I don't have a great answer. That's okay. <laughs> well, um, all right. So we will let you uh, continue with your presentation and we'll resume the Q&A session at the end. Um, so guys, we're going to try, uh, so a little bit of background. So this is me on the low left um, uh, in one of our series of videos. And this is Anna. She's one of our APPs, actually. She's a nurse practitioner. Um, and uh, we've been doing a whole series of shadowing videos um, for students. Uh, and the goal is for you guys, our goal is to mimic a clinical setting. So a couple caveats. So um, one, uh, we were doing this in the summer during the um, during COVID. And so there's some rules and regulations regarding simulation, essentially in keeping us safe. And we're hoping to continue to grow these. And as more people are vaccinated, we can safely like stage larger scenarios in the simulation lab. So, um, and hopefully we can stage at some point some pediatric ones with my kids. Um, so I will uh, link to them and then um, let's see if it works. We'll watch the two videos and then um, if the, we can talk about them afterwards. Okay, this is linking to the actual page for them. Um, let me. We pulled them up and made them work. So I apologize if there's a delay. Oh, here we go. It's not giving me my mouse. I think um, it might have been pulled up on uh, on the internet browser already in those separate tabs, or were those X'd out? Yeah, they're. I'm just not seeing them. Uh -huh. um. I think maybe I have to stop screen sharing. Okay. All right, sorry, I just had to stop screen sharing. So this is the first one um, and we'll watch it and then we'll watch the second um, and then we can talk about them. Oh, you know what, I can make it larger. Hey, what's going on? Dr. Lemery here, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Good, good. So uh, just saw your chart, uh, this sounds like you had a seizure. What's yeah, I was at work. Uh, I was at my computer at my desk, and you know, apparently, apparently I had a seizure. Yeah. All right, did your coworkers uh, see this, or? Yeah, my supervisor. Okay, so, you know, tell me, tell me at my desk. Okay, so you have a history of seizures. I do. I, I have epilepsy, but it really hasn't happened in, in several years. So. You know. Okay. Well, what, what do you take for it? Well, All right. And you've been taking your meds as uh, scheduled. I'm I'm pretty good about it. Decent. But, you know, not, not, lately, not that much. Okay, so maybe a little loss. Did yeah. you take it today? I did. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, a couple more questions. Are you taking any other meds? No. Any allergies to medicines? No. Okay. Uh, sometimes with seizures, people have a, uh, substance abuse issues. Any heavy drinking or... A few uh, drinks here and there, not, not anything out of the ordinary. Okay, you never get the shakes if you don't drink. No. Any no. other drug use at all? No. Um, any other medical problems we haven't talked about? No, nothing else. Any surgeries in your history? Like when I was 17, I had a, a tooth extracted. But that's really it. That's it. All right, a couple other questions for you. Um, uh, any headaches or vision changes or neck stiffness? Uh, just a... Ugh. Uh, all right. Hey, he's seizing. Guys, he's seizing. Garlic, can you give me uh, two milligrams of lorazepam, please?
there? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. He's got a lot of secretions here. Just start, uh, try to help me roll him. Please suction for me. Let's give him on some oxygen. Roll him on his side, please. Okay. Good. Let's put him back. Scarlett, will you put his uh, mask on for me? He has a history of seizures, so we got the Lorraine's with him. We're probably going to be able to keep an eye on him, and uh, we'll monitor for a little while, make sure this doesn't recover, and then we'll come back and reassess him a little bit. Okay, sounds good. Hey, how you doing, buddy? Okay, I'm tired. Yeah, okay, so you know by now you had a seizure here. We gave you medicine to protect your um, you from having another seizure. <clears throat> You know, in and of itself, this isn't terribly concerning because uh, you have a history of you knowing about this disease. Uh, you did say something, I don't know if you remember, before you see that you maybe haven't been super compliant with your medicines. So, one of the things that we're going to talk about is make sure you're taking your momentum um, as uh, prescribed. Okay? If you don't get on those meds regularly, you're not protecting your body. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. We're going to keep an eye on you for a little bit. Looks like you're recovering well. Um, and uh, is there something that we can get you before we send you home? I can call you. Call your mom. Okay, cool. So that'll be our plan. But, you know, we'll keep an eye on you. We'll probably get you something, uh, feed you something, making sure you can uh, make it through and let you go. Okay, Brown. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 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 So the first case we saw is a 25-year-old man with a seizure, a uh, seizure history. Generally, when patients like this come into the emergency department, it's all about the history and compliance on medications. Um, the fact that he had a seizure in front of us wasn't necessarily concerning, um, given the course of his history. We do want to make sure that he gets supportive care, um, thinking about airway, oxygenation. Um, most seizures actually go away on their own. So you don't necessarily have to give uh, medication for that one-time seizure in front of the emergency department. Um, although we did, we chose to do that because what that does is it protects him using a benzodiazepine in the short term while we figure out what his medical compliance was. Um, his seizure was otherwise uncomplicated. Um, they often have a post-pictal state where they'll be confused for about 20 minutes, 40 minutes after the seizure, but then they come around and wake up and are able to give a squib history. And you can see this is a very classic case of somebody who wasn't taking their medications um, and uh, attributed that to the cause of the seizure. One other thing you always have to be thinking about is a drinking history. Remember, um, alcohol particularly is a depressant. So if patients um, are taking lots of depressants and then for some reason don't, their body goes into an excitatory state, making a bad drinking history for whatever reason, whether through illness or their own choice to sort of get dry, they can put themselves in big danger of going through alcohol withdrawals, um, which often manifest as seizures. Really important part of the medical history. The, the idea of rolling him out of his side when he, the seizure stopped, but he had this um, sonorous breathing pattern, was that he was now at risk of swallowing his own secretions, which can be very dangerous uh, to the airway. So by rolling him on his side, all the secretions come out as opposed to back in into the airway. Um, and it also allowed us to suction him and get the, the secretions out. It doesn't last very long. Usually people with uh, seizures, when they extinguish, are able to protect their airway shortly thereafter. But to that critical few minutes uh, after their seizure stops, it's an important part of supporting the airway. Another thing you always have to worry about is trauma. Secondary to the seizure, remember seizures come on quickly and patients can often fall in precarious places on concrete, hit their head, dislocate their shoulders. So a good post-seizure trauma exam, looking at you know, any abrasions or tongue biting, um, making sure that all their uh, extremities are intact is really, really important. That part we didn't include in 
our secondary assessment, um, but it'll be very important after a seizure to make sure that there's no secondary trauma. In some extreme cases, of what we call as refractory seizures, where the seizure just doesn't stop, that it, uh, mandates a intensive care unit level of care with um, lots of uh, drugs and supportive care. That is very rare, but that's called status of olympicus. And again, it's something that uh, can happen with seizures that don't go away and that can become very dangerous. So it necessitates um, a lot of hands-on supportive intensive care. Next slide. Hey guys, can you hear me? All right, I am going to um, uh, pull up the second video. Um, did we feel like there was too much lag um, in the video to watch the second one? Do we want to try the second one? Elaine, uh, I thought it was okay. Uh, okay. It, it, it worked for me. It, it had a little bit of lag, but it, it, it wasn't bad. Okay. For me, it has no lag, so it's hard to know. All right, now, whoops. All right, so um, guys, this is another one. This one's a little bit longer. Um, and in here, we, uh, we film this to, um, to mimic sort of um, someone working with a medical student and how that dynamic works. And um, so it's a little bit different, it's a little bit longer. And then um, I'm happy to talk about the cases at the end, um, but you kind of see the dynamic between an attending physician, which is someone who's finished their training. And in this instance, we have one of our um, superb fourth year medical students.
there anything that uh, you particularly like the worst? Um, not that I noticed. Like, what about like, music? Um, I pretty much all day working from home, so it's hard for me to distinguish, you know, if it's a meal or a snacking. So I kind of pop them. Pop them, okay. Right. And do you, by any chance, notice that what time they kind of just pop up throughout the day, or like at night, or in the morning, like throughout the entire day? So, probably more at the evening time. And can you tell me more about what kind of things you've done to uh, work your pain? So I take pumps and Tylenol and ibuprofen, the stuff they sell you when you like, look it up online. And stuff. Uh, it hasn't really helped as much as I thought it would. Is there anything in particular that you know you think would help for us?
Um, since I have you here, I'm just going to take notes at your levels as well, okay. okay? So I need you just to take some deep breaths for me. Sounds great. I'm gonna take this into the back real okay. quick, alright? So I can help you up. And just take some deep breaths for me. Great. And I'm gonna touch your spine over here. Do you feel anything back here when I touch? No. Okay, good. So how do you uh, relax for me? Uh, so now what I wanna do is I wanna take a look. Hey guys, so it sounds like we're having um video issues. So we can send you guys all the links to the videos to do later um, if you're interested in it. And then we have a case to work through as well. And so we can just do the case instead um, if we're having problems with the video. Does that sound like a plan? That sounds great. And Elena, can, we, can I do a couple of follow-up questions on this case? Yeah, of course. Um, we had a lot of um, points being made here and, and, and in my own experience as an emergency doc, when you're trying to get in the issue of how to politely ask patients at the bedside, you know, when they've had substance abuse problems without turning them off, you know, what, what is your experience of a technique of doing that? I think that's a great question. So, um, Will, one of the reasons I picked this one actually, and I, I apologize for the technical issues, um, Will does a really nice job of just being very non-judgmental. And so um, when I try and approach patients um, about issues like this, so, you know, I, one, I, I don't ever start there. Like the problem here is a choice you're making or something like that. I try and establish a, um, you know, a good relationship with them, even though it's in a setting where we're trying to establish that very quickly. Um, and I try and you know, really make sure that they're heard about their symptoms. Um, and then I try and just be very non-judgmental about it. Um, and so, uh, so not coming in with like preconceived bi biases and recognizing that um, substance abuse is a disease process, right? Like one thing that, one of the things I often say to the medical students is like, no one writes in their third grade book report that they wanna grow up and like, you know, have substance abuse um, problems and withdraw every time they stop drinking um, and have their whole family mad at them. And so I think approaching patients, all patients, no matter what they're there for, with respect and compassion um, and in a non-judgmental way goes a long way, right? We all make choices that are specific to our lives. Some of them are healthier than others. Like um, I don't always make perfect choices in terms of, you know, like I didn't get on my Peloton or go for a run today. Like, and if I was going to make the healthiest choice for my life, I would have. Um, and so just trying to always be compassionate um, and hearing patients and non-judgmental in the way you ask questions and in the way you counsel them is to me a really important way to do that. So. And um, an, exa an example of how a physician could be judgmental is that after a few questions, you've got a good idea that they're, they've got a real alcohol problem. And if you say, you're killing yourself with alcohol, well, that's true that they're killing themselves with alcohol. But on the other hand, on most people, that's such a slap in the face, they stop hearing you. Yeah. You know, they quit listening. Yeah. And, and so thus, you're no longer their doctor, you're their accuser, you know. And I think that's a good point. Like, most patients already know that it's a problem, like, and they, they're there because they want help. Like they're not, you know, it's not like news to them that they're drinking too much alcohol or that they shouldn't be using drugs. That it's not healthy for them. Like they're there because they need help. Um, and the more confrontational you are, the less effective you will be in taking care of them. So. Wonderful. Well, you have another case for us, I believe. I do. Um, I made a case. Um, uh, and we, let me go into presenter mode. Um, so this is an infectious disease related case, which is near and dear to my heart, um, because this is a lot of the training I did. And so we'll, um, talk through this case. Um, 
And then I'm going to kind of talk about um, the differential diagnosis and the um, uh, kind of how we would manage this case. Um, and so uh, this is a 33 year old female who presented to the emergency department after recent travel. Um, so the patient reports that they were visiting family in Ethiopia. Um, uh, she stayed for about a month and returned home to the United States. Um, the fever started a week after returning. Past medical history was significant for um, pregnancy times two. The patient had had two prior C-sections. They took no medicine, they had no allergies. Um, and then we talk about review of systems. So they had a fever, but otherwise no cough, no URI symptoms, no rash, no nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Um, and then I wanted to talk about kind of um, fever in a traveler um, and what this case would look like. So when I, when I approach fever in a returning traveler, we see this actually a good bit in Denver, Colorado, um, because we are quite close to um, a major airport, so to a major hub. So I sort of break things into two things. So the first is I think about just plain old fever in any um, person. And so common things being common, right? Right now, we always worry about COVID-19, but common colds, influenzas, any viral illness that can cause fever. I think about common things like urinary tract infections. I think about things like pneumonia. Um, we think about something called sepsis, which is usually an uncontrolled acute bacterial infection that can make people quite ill. Um, and then in travelers, um, I throw a different set of um, things on that differential diagnosis. And I'm happy to talk about all of these, but I kind of picked um, a couple of them that I thought were really interesting to talk about today with you guys um, and talk about kind of how we think about these cases and how we think about these differential diagnoses and how we counsel patients in the travel clinic before they go on ways to stay safe. So, um, and we'll talk about these disease processes and we can go on for as long as you want. But I think about diseases that are really specific to travel. So these are not things you're gonna pick up in the United States. Um, so yellow fever, which we'll talk about malaria, um, typhoid fever, meningitis, and then hepatitis A. Hepatitis A actually you can pick up in the United States. There's an out, been an outbreak in hepatitis A in our homeless patient population in the past couple of years. Actually the point we started um, attempting to vaccinate inside the emergency department to um, control the spread of it. But so um, when I approach a patient in the infectious disease clinic before they travel, and anytime I'm thinking about travel related illness, the first and most important thing is where did you go? Um, and the CDC does an absolutely incredible job of having country maps um, for all over the world that lists specific infectious disease concerns related to that area of the country. So this patient um, traveled to yellow, or sorry, traveled to Ethiopia. Um, and Ethiopia is one of the places in the world where we see yellow fever. And so um, this is actually the CDC map. If you can see and everywhere that's highlighted yellow is where there is active yellow fever spread and where the CDC recommends vaccination prior to travel. And so, um, some background on yellow fever. So yellow fever is a viral illness. It's um, actually a flavivirus. It causes fevers, chills, it causes muscle aches. And one of the reasons it's called yellow fever is it, it can lead to um, liver failure and the patients then develop jaundice. And so their skin turns yellow and their eyes turn yellow. Um, and one of the great things about yellow fever um, is it, it is a vaccine preventable disease. And so yellow fever, um, everyone who's gotten their COVID vaccine now actually has like a COVID vaccination card. Um, but for yellow fever, we've been doing this for years and years and years. So um, when you get your yellow fever vaccine, um, you get, and these cards are pretty much the same all over the world. I actually found this photo, someone is selling their yellow fever card on eBay. Um, so it is not an actual like patient of mine's photo because I would not be HIPAA compliant. Um, it's whoever is selling their yellow fever uh, card on eBay. But um, 
So you get a card that shows that you've been vaccinated for yellow fever and we sign it and stamp it. Um, and there are multiple countries around the world where you either need this or you need a medical exemption like an allergy um, to enter the country because they're trying so hard to control yellow fever. Um, yellow fever is uh, spread by a mosquito. It's spread for, by the 80s mosquito, which is the same one who does Zika, uh, dengue, chikungunya. Um, and the 80s mosquito um, is difficult to control because one, it can breed in as little as a single drop of water. Um, and two, it is not a night biter. It tends to be like a dawn and dusk biter. And so bed nets tend to be much less effective. And so um, yellow fever is a disease that um, people are very aggressive about trying to um, prevent with vaccinations. The mortality is definitely quite high. I mean, double digits, like upwards of 30% mortality. Um, and if you look on a worldwide basis, we've actually for the past several years had a yellow fever outbreak that originated in Brazil um, and has been quite aggressive. And so the United States actually ended up on a vaccine shortage as a result um, of some problems related to supply and some um, problems related to um, vaccine being redistributed to Brazil. And so we started actually importing our yellow fever vaccine from Europe. Um, so that we could have a greater supply for patients. Um, and unfortunately, they, a lot of the treatment for yellow fever is what we call supportive care. So it's like hospitalization in an ICU. There's not a lot of medicine that really truly helps to um, control the infectious illness. This is one where like an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So we talk about um, staying safe, and this is where I think kind of global health and wilderness medicine start to merge. So you can vaccinate to prevent it, but then there's so many things you can do um, to prevent yourself from getting bitten from a um, mosquito perspective. So we talk about wearing long sleeves, wearing long pants. We talk about using um, uh, DEET, which is an anti-mosquito agent on your skin. And then there's something you can treat your clothing with called permethrin, and it lasts through several, several washes. So when we have patients come into the travel clinic, we look at where they're going, and then we talk about what are your yellow fever risks and what can you do to mitigate it. Um, and then we counsel everyone to get the yellow fever vaccine as long as they don't have specific medical exemptions to it. So, um, the second one I want to talk about is... Um, hey, hey Elaine, I, um, can yellow fever yeah. be spread person to person? Yellow fever is spread, it's mosquito-borne. So um, it's from the bite of a mosquito. Thank you. You're welcome. So the second one we um, commonly think about, depending on your area um, of travel, is meningitis. And probably a lot of you have actually had your meningitis vaccines. Um, in the United States, we tend to see um, meningitis in college students, in um, you know, military recruits. Those are the things we often think about. Um, that is not true in other parts of the world. Um, and actually in Africa, we have what's called the meningitis belt. Um, and you can see it's the dark gray area. And so this is an area of the world where we tend to see outbreaks of meningitis. Um, and meningitis in all settings can be life-threatening, whether you're in the United States or whether you're in Ethiopia. Although, um, you know, if you're in Ethiopia, your ability to access medical care may be much more limited. Um, meningitis is an acute, at least well, there are viral, but we're talking about bacteria. It's an acute um, infection uh, and it can be life-threatening. It's highly contagious. Um, and in the United States, you know, it tends to transmit like we'll see it in, say, college dorm students. In parts of the world, it actually tends to transmit during specific seasons. And so, um, so in Africa, it tends to transmit during the dry season. And there's a lot of theories as to why that is. Some people think that there's more dust. Um, some people think it has to do with um, kind of how population lives and moves during seasons. But it tends to, be, there tends to be seasonal transmission. Um, if we have a patient with suspected acute meningitis, uh, we get really aggressive really fast. So in the emergency room, we look at using things like steroids, we start heavy antibiotics. 
um, trying to uh, get the infection under control as quickly as possible. Um, we'll often do a CT of their head to make sure the reason they're confused is not um, something else like a mass. And then we'll usually draw off spinal fluid. We do what's called a lumbar puncture and we put a needle in the spine and we draw off spinal fluid and we look to see um, what's growing in that fluid and uh, what we can kind of um, expect. And then often these patients are in the ICU being monitored. Most of the time patients with meningitis will present very ill. So we call, we say they're often what we call toxic looking. So they look quite sick. They'll have headaches, they'll have fevers, they'll have chills. They often will report neck stiffness. So they struggle to touch their chin, chin to their chest and they can decompensate quite quickly. So in the United States, um, we don't have to worry about things like um, tuberculosis, uh, TB related meningitis is much less common, but there's definitely parts of the world where we'll see TB um, causing problems and it tends to um, attack a portion of the brain um, that helps control movement. And so the, it, it tends to most highly express itself in um, what we call the cerebellum. So it is also a vaccine preventable disease. And I bet many of you got your meningitis vaccine before you went to college. Um, or if you're in the military, uh, they vaccinate you before um, you uh, usually like join your recruit class. In the infectious disease clinic, um, Colorado has a really nice vaccine uh, reporting system. So I can usually see in a state database what vaccines you've had. And if you're traveling anywhere in or near the meningitis belt, um, I tend to, you know, really recommend patients get it because even if you could maybe survive it in the United States, like if you're, you know, traveling and there's not the same access to medical care, um, you can get really sick and die. And so it's another so, one that we are really aggressive about recommending. So Elaine, um, um, yellow fever, for example, of the many, many hundreds of thousands of viruses is a virus and meningococcus mm -hmm. is a bacteria. What's the difference? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, uh, gosh, that's also a very broad question. Um, so uh, how do I explain this? So usually, um, so usually a bacteria um, is like a single celled organism that self replicates. Um, and can be infectious viruses. There's many different times, types of viruses like Ebola, yellow fever, COVID-19, the common cold. Um, usually viruses are like chunks of um, genetic material, whether DNA and RNA, and some of them are encapsulated. Um, and they, they tend to like hijack your own body's replication system and your own body systems. And so a bacteria, is like a self-contained cell that um, comes in and wreaks havoc. A virus tends to enter your body um, and then almost hijack your own body's like cellular mechanisms to create its own proteins and replicate itself. Um, can you generally state that, that many bacteria can be treated with antibiotics, whereas most viruses cannot be treated with an antiviral? Okay, that, yeah, that's 100% true too. Sorry, I think I gave a more uh, like academic nebulous response, but that's true too. No, your response was excellent. Uh, so the virus then is genetic material that takes over the genetic apparatus of the cell so the cell makes more viruses. Whereas the bacteria comes in and sets up housekeeping and runs itself and does whatever destructive thing that it does. Like in the case of men meningitis, Neisseria meningitis, it comes in and does cellular destruction like in the brain. I mean, it's it's a terrible thing, uh, but at least we have antibiotics for some of these bacteria and we have some antivirals that can be effective at controlling some of the viruses, correct? Like uh, the protease inhibitors and uh, AZT for, uh, or Truvada, I'm, I'm showing my age with AZT for uh, HIV. But by and large, a virus is not necessarily curable with a drug, a bacteria can be cured. That's definitely true too. So. Well, I didn't mean um, to interrupt. I, I just for the, uh, 
<laughs> I no, mean, there's even great. high school kids on here. So I, I just wanted to do a little bit of physiology there. I mean, viruses are fascinating. Like the pathology that we see from them. Like, it, I mean, on some level, I sort of wonder like, what's the point? Like, why do they even exist? But that is not a discussion for here or there. So I feel like, so my undergrad degree was molecular genetics. And I feel like I sat through an entire week where we tried to argue whether or not a virus was actually alive. Because if it can't survive independent of um, a human host, like does, is it actually a living thing? So, um, so now we're gonna move into the world of parasites. Um, and so this is a map of malaria um, areas of Ethiopia. And the same thing, um, the United States has a, for every country, they have yellow fever, um, meningitis, but they also have malaria maps. Um, and we will um, talk about it, malaria. So we think about it in kind of two ways. So malaria is spread by a mosquito as well. It's spread by the Anopheles mosquito. So different than Zika, dengue, chikungunya, and yellow fever. And the good thing about the Anopheles mosquito is that it is a night biter. Um, and that means that um, the mosquito comes in and it has a blood meal. So it bites um, a human being and then it sucks up their blood. And then after a blood meal, what the mosquito does, they actually are not very effective at flying. And so they try and land. And so bed nets work in some ways to prevent you from getting bit but actually bed nets are most effective because often they end up with holes. A lot of them are treated with an agent that kills the mosquito. And so the mosquito bites and it gets infected with malaria and then it goes and it lands um, on the bed net because that's the nearest thing. And at that point, um, uh, most of the bed nets are treated and it the, kills the mosquito. And so what you're doing is interrupting the transmission cycle. Um, which is one of the reasons why bread nets are great in addition to uh, protecting people. And in some countries where um, there's really aggressive malaria, they've tried doing things like painting the walls with um, stuff to kill the mosquito to interrupt that life cycle. So infection occurs through a bite. Um, and what essentially happens is the, the malaria bites you. Um, it like vomits um, the malaria inside your bloodstream. And then the malaria goes through a life cycle involving your liver um, and ends up infecting your red blood cells. Um, and it undergoes kind of an entire life cycle in your red blood cells. And there's four different types of malaria we commonly talk about. There's a fifth, but we're not really going to go into that. And th this bottom um, photo is actually a photo of falciparum. It's the most dangerous one we see and the most deadly. And the hard part for malaria is a number of things. So the first is that it's quite dangerous. It tends to be particularly dangerous in pregnant and the immunocompromised and the very young. Um, and it causes damage to the red blood cells. Um, and actually, you know, this one is called, Fals this one is falciparum. You can recognize it because it, it has this characteristic, like almost the diamond ring. See how it has the dot and the ring. So this is one way we know this is the falciparum. Another one is see how it looks like headphones. So um, that's the parasite in the red blood cell. Those are both like totally characteristic to falciparum and not the other types. But when you look at children who grow up in very malaria endemic areas, you'll often find that they have very low hemoglobin. So they're, um, they are so used to being infected with malaria again and again that the red blood cell counts will be incredibly low because the malaria causes the red blood cells to lice. Um, it can result in fevers, chills, headaches. Um, people with malaria can end up with cerebral malaria. So it can cause, uh, it can get into the brain and cause damage. It can cause damage to the liver. Um, it can definitely be life-threatening. There is treatment um, that exists and it exists all over the world. Part of the hard part with malaria is that um, malaria is constantly evolving um, and it's starting to become immune to some of the treatments. So I feel like hydroxychloroquine became quite famous um, in the past nine months. And part of the reason it became, you know, it became famous because of COVID, but it, um, it was originally developed as an anti-malarial. 
We don't actually use it um, anymore because uh, the parasite has become resistant to it in many parts of the world. Um, so we um, have medicine that we use to treat malaria um, and it's widely available all over most of the world. Um, but also we use medicines to prevent it. So we use malrinone, we use mefloquin, and we use doxycycline, um, which is a medicine people have often heard of because it's an antibiotic. Um, uh, and so if a patient is traveling to a malaria endemic area, um, when they're in the emergency, or sorry, when they're in the infectious disease clinic, I usually have a discussion about what are you going to be doing? What are your risks? And first is prevention, right? So um, long sleeves, DEET, um, protecting your clothing. And then bed nets are used all over the world. And there's been um, huge pushes to get everyone who lives in a malaria endemic area sleeping under a bed net. And then countries try and do things like remove stagnant water, um, things like that. And then we'll start patients on medicine um, to prevent the development of malaria. Um, and so those were kind of the three I wanted to talk about. And then I feel like that's been enough. And so I was gonna switch to uh, questions from you guys. Unless no one has any. All right, yes, we got plenty of questions. <laughs> so uh, I'll start with the first one here. Um, do you often get called out to trauma scenes such as natural disasters? So um, if I was on, um, there are federal disaster committees where people definitely do that. Um, my hospital is actually partnering with um, Team Rubicon, uh, which is a, um, a group in the United States. Um, and we're looking at taking, being on call one week a year to deploy with them to disasters, which I signed up to do. Um, and so I guess I, will probably start to do that. Although I haven't for the past couple of years because I um, was either pregnant or had an infant. And I don't really think anyone wants like a pregnant ER doc in the middle of a disaster zone. So I could create more problems than I would solve. You're still muted. I'm sorry, thank you for reminding uh. me. Uh, so uh, another question that many students had, uh, how does vaccine distribution change in regards to the high altitude as far as storage and delivery is concerned, or does it affect it at all? Um, as it has not affected it at all for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. Okay, um, well, uh, the next one here is how diverse is wilderness and travel medicine uh, in terms of both demographics and experience, um, such as traditional students versus non-traditional students? I think wilderness medicine, probably less. So travel medicine is a lot of infectious disease and global health. And so um, I, I think in terms of diversity, it tends to be much better. Um, so, you know, in the infectious disease, um, like research working group I work in, um, uh, I work with uh, two other physicians um, who are amazing and lovely mentors for me, um, but they're both infectious disease trained. And the, one of them is from Mexico and the other is from Colombia. Um, in terms of our patient population, um, the majority of, I mean, I love travel cases um, because they're so much fun, but the majority of my patients um, are born abroad, a lot of them from different parts of Africa. And the majority of them have then moved to the United States um, and the most common thing we see is they move to the United States, um, you know, they get married, they have children, and then they've been living here for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And what they want to do is take their kids back to meet their family. And that might partially because we're like the joint clinic where it's me and a pediatrician. Um, and so we call it family clinic, but um, we tend to get a lot of families that are returning to their um, uh, birth countries. Um, and going home because they want to, you know, have their children learn about their culture and learn about their home and meet family that's back home. And so I think diversity there tends to be quite strong just based on, you know, who's a, who's coming into the clinic. So. Thank you. 
Um, and so uh, our next question is, how do the altitude related illnesses differ between Colorado residents and non-Colorado residents? That's a great question. So um, when I first moved to Colorado for residency from Cincinnati, Ohio, I was convinced everyone had cancer um, and a specific type of cancer because everyone's red blood cell counts was high. And I was like, another person with cancer, like what is going on? Um, and it took me a while to realize like, so living in Colorado, a lot of things happen. So, um, and it starts like even from infancy. So pregnant women in Colorado, their placentas tend to be larger. When babies are born, they're all a little bit blue. It's like just totally normal. Um, and the right heart tends to develop a little bit more in Colorado and in other altitude places, probably less so in Denver, but more in the mountains. But also in like Nepal and in areas of Peru, this tends to be really common. Um, altitude itself is an independent risk factor for stillborn. Um, and I didn't realize this until I was uh, teaching in Peru, but in a lot of the uh, rural Peruvian areas, there's this huge um, uh, superstition that um, if you are pregnant above where the crops grow, then I forget the exact su superstition that um, the Peruvian medical providers were explaining to me, but essentially like the, there's a superstition that if you're pregnant above where the crops grow, um, that like a witch will come and snack your, snatch your pregnancy from you. And so a lot of the women, what they'll do is move to lower lying levels um, to where the crops grow uh, um, throughout the duration of the pregnancy. And someone finally went and studied it and realized that um, the crops stop growing about the point where the altitude becomes significant enough that the risk of miscarriage really climbs. And so it's almost like this myth that sprang up um, around uh, pregnancy that protects the women because they move to lower altitudes and they are less likely to have stillborns as a result. So we see that we see some different disease pathologies um, in Colorado, things can be worse like COPD and sickle cell. And then we see changes in the human body. So we have more red blood cells um, uh, in people who live in Colorado. Um, we offload uh, um, oxygen from our red cells differently because we have a larger proportion of a certain chemical that helps um, oxygen fall off the red blood cells. Um, and then there's just other things. There's like micro changes in the heart and things like that. So. That's very interesting. Thank you. Um, and so uh, I think, so let's see. So how much time uh, do you spend outside and actually in the wilderness? And what type of record keeping do you use in the wilderness? Um, is it electronic or on paper? So um, because of two pregnancies um, and a mountain biking accident, I'm not on a search and rescue team right now. Um, and so I'm not, almost all my clinical care is in the emergency department. Uh, when I'm in the like woods with students or in Central America with them, then, you know, if something comes up, I'm there. Um, but I'm not doing search and rescue right now. Um, and I'm not ski patrolling right now, which hopefully I will start doing in the next couple of years. Most of the time people um, who are doing those carry like a portable, uh, like, an easy tear off portable series of um, notes they can write. And then they usually write in pencil so it can't um, like bleed. And then what we teach patients to do is do their documentation and then send it with the patient. So, and then I tell patients, if you put a tourniquet on someone, you should write on their forehead, the tourniquet time. So it never gets missed. And so it can't fall off the patient. So take a Sharpie and write it on their forehead. Well, that's smart. Um, and so I, I know that uh, during the beginning of the pandemic, you worked um, uh, in collaboration with physicians across the world um, talking about COVID and, and how it's affecting our bodies. Um, one of the students is wondering, will the UK strain um, of COVID impact vaccine effectiveness that you know of? Oh gosh, we've been obsessed with discussing that. Um, so as far as I can tell the sequence, so the messenger RNA, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine um, our messenger RNA against the spike protein. The UK strain has 10 mutations in the spike protein, including one that affects the ACE receptor binding site. 
So my understanding is that the assumption is that it's more contagious because, and feel free someone else to jump in if you know this literature better than me, is more contagious because it has better binding with our ACE receptors. So it creates a tighter fit, like a lock and key. And so it's more contagious. With that said, the assumption is that the messenger RNA is um, injected in us as the entire spike protein. And what your body does is synthesizes that protein and then chunks it up into little bits and creates antibodies against it. So the hope is that there is enough conservation in the spike protein, despite those 10 mutations, that um, vaccine, the vaccine will still be effective. Will it be 95% effective? We don't know. We also don't know how long the vaccine will last, frankly, um, because we are seeing COVID reinfection or I, we have seen some COVID reinfection. And so I, I guess it's all a great big unknown. My hope is that the vaccine continues to be effective and that the spike protein is conserved enough that the vaccine uh, still works against it. Right, but, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, we'll um, find out. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully soon. Um, and so since the pandemic has began, have you seen an increase in other wildlife, or sorry, other wilderness accidents? Um, I don't think I have personally. So Colorado first got COVID in the ski resorts, which we expected because that's where we have the most tourism and the most travel. We get people from all over the world. And the mountain towns got absolutely overwhelmed with COVID and they were um, transporting everyone down to Denver. Um, and then the ski resorts essentially just shut down because they were like, we're destroying our small towns right now, um, which stopped all, you know, COVID related infectious disease travel to skiing. Um, and so uh, that seems to be helpful. Um, where we go from here, I guess I don't really know. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and how do you balance professional life and family life? So something like raising young children as a physician mom. That's a good question. So um, I am careful about what projects I take on, um, although I have a tendency to take on way too many projects. Um, I try and like instill balance. So like if I'm working a bunch of clinical shifts, like I was just working, um, then when I come home, I try and like be present with my family um, and let like do have the academic stuff wait until I'm off for a day or two. Um, and so that I can like be there with my kids and take care of them. I think emergency medicine tends to be really good um, at, at like helping you have a family life and um, practice medicine because a lot of it is shift work. And then the other stuff I do can be slotted in around it. I will tell anyone out there who wants um, to have a family or wants to be a mom, there's like um, a huge Facebook group for physician moms. It's called Physician Mom Group. And there's something like 70,000 doctor moms from all over the world in it. In every possible medical specialty, um, from EM to neurosurgery, and they're all like making it work. And I, we talk about how do we balance kids and work like all the time constantly, but if 70,000 women around the world can do it, like I, you know, I think we can be successful at it. So. That's right. Um, and so uh, do you believe your training in wilderness medicine has better prepared you for the emergency medicine type of working style? Uh, things like being fast paced, potentially higher stress levels and things like that. I mean, I think my residency training itself did a great job. Um, I think emergency medicine is really, um, you know, like the, my residency program did an excellent job of training me. Um, and it was difficult at times, but like also, a, you know, it's really a lot of fun. Like I, I thought residency was kind of a lot of fun because you're just like learning and seeing so many new things. Wilderness medicine is just an offshoot of that. I think, you know, EMS, wilderness medicine, global health, they kind of like all focus on um, mental flexibility in terms of clinical care, like working with the resources you have, being creative, like being, working as part of a team with like different people, um, with different levels of training and all of that 
like plays quite well into emergency medicine. It's all kind of the same thing. Like in wilderness medicine, um, you know, we say when you're going to go evacuate a patient on average, it takes like, if you're going to do an actual carry out of the woods with no extra supplies, it's not one or two people. It's usually like a dozen people who are actually doing that carry out to do it safely. And so it's a lot of like teamwork and communication. And those skills are just as important as the e in the ER as they are anywhere else. So. That's right. um, and so I'll ask two more questions um, before we um, hand it off just so that we can uh, keep an eye on time. Uh, but the second to last question, um, what are the biggest challenges on virtual patient visits for you? That's a good question. Um, the hard part is like your physical exam is really, really limited. Um, when we're, when we're looking at ICU level care in some of the outlying communities, like there's, you know, iPads and you're working with the nurses and working with the team that's there. Um, when you're doing, we have like a virtual urgent care even, a lot of that is really the physical exam. And so things that probably are absolutely fine and don't need to go to the ER and you could probably just, you know, write that UTI like some macro bid and send them on their way. Um, because you can't really say press on their kidneys or make sure that there's nothing else going on. Um, I think a lot more of those get sent in because of the lack of physical exam. Um, and so I think that's the biggest limitation. I mean, there's upsides, right? Like in terms of COVID-19, it's much safer. There's no risk of infection to the patient. As, um, uh, you know, it's really easy to just like uh, video patients and check in with them and see how they're doing and patients like it a lot and they're more likely to come to their virtual visit than their in-person visit. Um, but I think the lack of physical exam is definitely um, limiting. Yeah, that's true, thank you. And so the last question for tonight, um, do you think climate change will facilitate a change in the training that emergency medicine or wilderness medicine physicians undergo and um, should disaster medicine be a component of all medical education now? So those, yeah, so that's a great question. So um, in the, in the, so I'm in the section of wilderness and environmental medicine. Um, and we, um, we do a lot of climate change work actually. And um, maybe three years ago now, uh, my um, section chief started a fellowship in climate change and human health. And so we're taking ER docs and doing research, trying to identify um, how climate change will affect human health and the implications it'll have. Um, uh, I just edited um, a book, um, not the whole book. I edited the like, uh, the like online curriculum that's coming out in association with it. Um, I think the basis of it is that climate change will disproportionately um, affect vulnerable populations, um, the poor um, and people who live in low income countries um, more than it'll probably more than it'll affect like extremely wealthy um, countries. And so um, emergency medicine to me is the field that goes everywhere and helps anyone under all circumstances. And so, I think it's like in a very important subset for emergency medicine. Um, I think we see the consequences, like when there's a heat wave, we see the elderly patients that get ill. When there's a hurricane um, that's potentially potentiated by climate change, like we see the repercussions of that a lot in the ED. So I think climate change is a huge area um, for emergency medicine and we're gonna have to be advocates for our patients to, um, protect them because we have the ability to advocate for them. I guess that's the first thing I'd say. In terms of disaster training, like, you know, I work in Aurora, Colorado, um, so I'm not likely to see a hurricane patient. Um, but the EM group that I'm part of, we've had three mass shootings now. So we've had Columbine, um, we've had Aurora, and we've had uh, another local high school shooting. And so I think disaster training is important in emergency medicine because no matter where you're at and what you're doing, like 
whether it's natural disasters, whether it's terrorism, whether it's mass shootings, like there's always a potential for a disaster situation. Um, and you need to, right, it's much better to be trained how to do that um, before you're like standing there with, you know, the ER falling around at your feet. So, and my residency program, we did definitely, we had lectures in disaster and we had training and we did disaster scenarios. My ER still does it like several times a year. We do um, disaster scenarios to be ready. So. Well, thank you so much for everything. Um, Dr. Reno, we really much enjoyed your presentation and, and your insights. Um, I think there might be a, another slide after this about the assessment. Elaine, while we're pulling that slide up, what a great talk. That's, I mean, it was, so very, very. Now you have one other thing. What is this? Suicide in high altitude? Oh, um, Reagan just asked me. She said the students like to read um, uh, papers if we reference them. And so she asked me to put papers I'd publish. So I just did a PubMed link to my last name. It's not that exciting. So, what a, so if what students a, want, they can just click on it and find it. Um, we will uh, post that on the website also under your lecture, um, Elaine. Elaine, what a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. The, everybody put a thank you into chat, all 500 of you that are still online right now. Elaine, you've been part, you're the 31st lecture now in this series in 10 months, during which time 335,000 Americans have died of a brand new disease. This is a very odd, very difficult time that we have no idea how this is going to work out. And so having folks of your training, your experience, and your grace to come on here and share your time <laughs> and taking your little baby out of your lap and joining us. And uh, we got to get you back to your kid right away soon. But we just want to thank you so much. 120,000 kids in 28 countries, all 50 states in the nation, over 30,000 kids have signed up, um, have been part of this program and you're now you're now one of the members and so we want you to know that you're family now and we're here for you and we just want to thank you so very very much for for taking your time to do this let me call on dr salazar for a moment to see if he has any closing comments oh, um I mean, so can somebody unmute dr salazar yes there we go i just unmuted him there you go Thank you so much, Dr. Carino. This was phenomenal. I, um, I've always been very proud to work with Wilderness Medicine, fellowship trained docs like yourself, and I've learned so much from you. I do want to learn at some point a little about uh, one of my, my biggest phobias in the world, which is uh, snakes. And so at some point, I hope to get some pointers from you about how to take care of patients with snake bites and deal with that uh, phobia in the future. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you guys for having me. It's great what you guys are doing. So it's, um, it's great to meet all the students. And, you know, uh, to all the students, like I'm online, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, uh, I know that Reagan said that she would send out, um, there's like a web page we have for all the shadowing videos. I apologize that it they didn't seem some of them didn't seem to run on all your computers. But um, Reagan said she'd send out the webpage for you guys and you're welcome to watch the shadowing videos there. And then if you're interested, um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email is easily available online if you just Google me. Um, and hopefully we see all 500 to 700 of you as future physicians one day. Absolutely. So. Well, just to end up on that point, um, Elaine, um, uh, Roughly 5,000 people will watch your video. Each one of them will become a medical person and see roughly 100,000 patient lives during a long career. 5,000 times 100,000 is a half a billion. You, Elaine, reached a half a billion lives tonight. And we just can't tell you how, how very grateful we are. So well, I appreciate the opportunity. I'm good. Uh, Shayan, do we have one more slide to, for the exam and all that? Yes, we do. Uh, I believe it's the next slide or the one after probably now. <laughs> okay, yes. So this is the information for tonight's assessment. Uh, the pin is up on the uh, screen right there and the password is Reno, all lowercase. Uh, and it will be due um, next Tuesday at 6.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. 
uh, right before the session. So be sure to take care of that. And um, that should be everything. I put the uh, quest base um, um, pin and password out on the chat so you can get it. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us. What a great session. Uh, uh, happy holidays to everybody. And unless uh, Shayan and uh, Dr. Reno and Dr. Salazar, I'm mistaken, we will see you all next year, right? So uh, yeah. <laughs> have a great evening. Have a great holidays. And thank you, everybody, for being on Virtual Shadowing. And good evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.